we do it from solar, which in turn is equal to 167 million barrels of dirty crude oil. The U.S. uses 94 quads a year. How many are available every year? 47,000. We're barely touching what's available. So 47,000 are available. And we use 40% of the energy in the world, really, pigs on it. And we're 5% of the population, but we use 40% of the world's energy. That's kind of crazy. And all this energy that we're talking about is free for the taking. It's in the sun. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about the myths behind solar. And, and, and people are like, I don't understand. It's, it's like magic. I used to think there was a magic box when you did solar that you had to pay a lot of money for and put on the wall. And, and, and basically, I found it was two breakers. It's like hooking up a stove, it's no different. It isn't difficult. It's actually very easy to do. Um, it's too cold and cloudy where I live. Well, Germany, Germany's a lot colder and cloudier than we are by far, especially in Southern California. And they're at 85%. They're actually decommissioning all their nuclear plants by 2022. They've already knocked out of 19. They're down to 11 left. And the rest will be gone pretty soon. Um, it is code there that you cannot build a house without solar being the roof. It is the roof. It isn't on the roof. It is the whole roof. And they collect rainwater off of it because it's glass. And it shades the building. And it gives multiple functions. So it's actually stacking functions is what we try to do in permaculture is everything you should do or you try to do does three things or more or you shouldn't do it. I wish our country would start working on that. Maybe. Uh, I don't want it on my roof, it's ugly. Well, I don't want it on the ground. I think it's ugly there. Another reason you don't do it on the ground is it's dirt down here. So your panels get dirtier faster. That's why solar farms have to be cleaned all the time. You ever put water in a bucket and there's a little bit of dirt down at the bottom? Where is it? It's down at the bottom, right? And this part up here is pretty clean because the dirt settles to the bottom. That's how it is in the air. The dirt is down low to the ground. So the higher up you go, the better it'll stay cleaner and more efficient, and also it gets cool. You put it on your roof, it's about four inches off the roof, air can move under it, it cools your house. So you're shading your house, and that's called overstoring your house. So when you put them on your roof, they're actually giving you those permaculture multiple functions. You just put a shade structure over your roof, a breeze will go up under it and cool it. So you just knock 10 or 15 degrees out of the hottest part of the day on your house, especially if you put it on the west side. Next slide. So this is Germany. Remember when I said that it is the roof? Here's the whole roof on the building. It's all solar. This is the side of the skyscraper. Where all the sun sides are all solar. The roof is all solar. And they're at 85% right now between wind and solar alone. That's all they do is wind and solar. Uh, Freeburg is called Solar City because they're the ones that are out in front. They're, they're, they're going to be at 100% within a year of all their total needs. Also, Germany is exporting all their excess energy during the day to the European Union, and they're making a lot of money. And then they pass laws where companies cannot work at night anymore. They want you to do it during the day when all this free energy is available. And they give the energy to industry, like Mercedes-Benz gets free energy during the midday time, and they just tell them, hire more people. You can have this energy for free for your plant, run your plant like crazy, but hire more people, make some jobs. <coughs> it's really, really smart for a country and a community and its citizens. Next slide. So one of the myths is technology is not ready. Do you know what that is? That's curiosity. That's on Mars. It went up there 13 years ago. It was only supposed to last 18 months, a year and a half. It's still going. This is 15-year-old battery and solar technology. So when people say the technology is not good, it's not ready, what do you think? They drove it off a cliff. They landed it there by bringing it in in a regular spacecraft that entered. Then they opened up a parachute. And then right before it hit the ground, it deployed these big airbags, and it bounced in these big airbags. <coughs> And then it righted itself, and then they drove it around. And they didn't expect it to last longer than 18 months because they figured it would get buried in the sand and the sandstorms, and that would be it. 
Well, they didn't count on the dirt devils coming along and cleaning the solar panels off and keeping it going. So, 13 years later, the Ford drive motors are burned out. They drive it backwards. It's still working with 15-year-old solar panel, the best of its time, but it's 15-year-old technology. Still working today. They're still using it, still communicating with it. So they don't even know what they're capable of doing. And the solar panels built today are guaranteed 25 years. They're mandated to be guaranteed 25 years. They'll last 200. They degrade. That means over time they get less efficient. They lose their power, like a light bulb wears out after time. Same thing. Uh, they're actually making panels that will last a thousand years already, <coughs> except they're not allowed to be imported into the U.S. Next, next slide. They fail easily. Well, it has a 25-year warranty. Um, they'll last over 100, maybe 200. They really don't know. The first one ever made is still in the Smithsonian, and it works at 70% of its original power. I've heard people say it doesn't pencil out, and I always say, well, whose pencil are you using? You're either using Edison's or the oil companies because they do pencil out. If you buy it and you put it on your roof, you're merely buying collectors. Remember, the sunlight's free. The sun comes out every day, and that's what creates the energy. So these are just collectors. So you buy the collectors, and when you finish paying for your collectors, <coughs> you never pay again for electricity. You're done. It's also on your roof. So what that means is you're not dependent on the wires coming from a plant a long ways away where they're charging you to push that energy to your home. You're paying for that electricity, but you never got it. That's transmission costs. So if you're using their, their pencil, yeah, it doesn't pencil out. But if you're using anybody else's pencil, they really do pencil out. And 30% is, is a rebate on any solar system. And it also includes if you build a, a structure to put it on, if you have to redo your roof to get your solar panels up there, they cover everything that you have to do to get solar on your home. So, um, I can't afford it. There's a hero program that's out. You can get bank loans now. Uh, there's a lot of stuff coming around, but the hero program is, is uh, basically PACE funds. And PACE funds came way back from Clinton's time. They put all this money away, and it was Congress that did this, to do energy efficiencies like solar, doors and windows, insulation, all this stuff. What happened was they did it, they put it in the account, and then the banks looked at it, and we're talking about HUD, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, these are all our federal lenders. They looked at it and they go, oh, we don't want to take a second to these loans. So if you loan this money to people, and they're talking to the local banks. If you loan this money and make these loans, we won't guarantee them. So nobody did it. So this money sat there for years and it grew from millions to billions. And that's where your 30% rebate comes from. That's where a new agreement will come from when they make it in 2017, they're probably going to. Obama wants to continue pushing these things forward. So basically you get 30% back from the federal government on your income taxes. You put it on your property tax bill, so you are not getting a loan on your credit. Your house is getting a loan, because it's on your property tax. <coughs> it has nothing to do with you. Um, you can finance it 5, 10, 15, or 20 years. So you can make it affordable like a car payment. You go buy a car, you pick how long the term is and how much you want to pay, and you get your payments down when you're comfortable. Also, you can write off the interest on the loan because it's on your property tax bill. So you get an interest write-off, you get a 30% rebate. Hero lets you get the rebate, put it onto the bill, and reduce the loan by a third when you get it. So you can drop that and make the down payment from your friendly federal government. What if the residential property is on the credit card? Doesn't matter. If there's a property tax bill, you can put it on the bill. If you have, like we have a vacation rental, I can't take the 30% rebate on my personal taxes, but I write that off on my business for two years. I take it in two years instead of one year. I still get it, actually I get more. It works out better for businesses. So you've got a lot of realtors now that know that people like it on the roof already done, and it makes a house sell faster, so they're putting solar on to get the houses to sell faster. 
and they want to move them. Um, people don't want to do it because they're still unsure and they're afraid of it. But if it's already done, they'll move in in a minute and take it. <coughs> so it is affordable. There's ways to finance it. Banks are loaning on it now because heroes come on the scene and they have to compete. Otherwise, they're missing out on all this money, right? So that's what's happening. They're starting to open up their doors and do it. Um, you're still only going to get like a, a seven-year loan maybe out of a bank. You can get 20 years out of Hero. And basically, say you moved out in 10, you paid for 10 years of it, somebody else moves in and they pay for the last 10. You don't pay for the whole system. There is no prepayment penalty, so if you get a big chunk of money, you can pay your panels off, and then you don't pay electric bill anymore, and you don't pay for panels anymore. You got free electricity. Okay. Next slide. So going back to the beginning, we had fire, then we started burning wood. And so in 1628, that's how much forest was in the United States. And then you get up to the 1858 or so there, and we started burning everything in sight because we're moving into the Industrial Revolution. And then you're in 1928 right there, and you can see the whole East Coast then deforested. So we started looking around going, gee, we're, out of, we're running out of wood. We need something new, we need something that burns hotter because we're doing all these metal things now that we need to melt metal. So they came up with coal. So that was the next one. And right in there about the same time we were doing palm oil and whale oil, you know, harvesting those things, depending on where you were in the world. So after coal, we moved into fossil fuels, which is where we are and still are today. We're kind of stuck on that note. Uh, next slide. So we discovered fire down at the bottom. We began deforestation, which continues today. We don't even notice what we did today, but we did a lot way back when. Um, plant animals. Uh, we went into the medieval times and the industrial age. We got into awful wood and started into coal and then the fossil fuels. I'm a member of a group called Transition Joshua Tree. It's a global uh, grassroots movement. And we deal with three things, climate change, local economy, and peak oil. We know we're at peak oil because we're squeezing rocks, and we're fracking to get natural gas out of the earth, and we're opening wells we closed, you know, oil wells we closed 50 years ago because they weren't profitable. You're out of oil when you're doing those things. And all this burning we've done is what contributed to climate change. We know that because that's what causes it, is all the gases that come out of burning. And it isn't just cars, it's lighting up cigarettes. Imagine how much, if everybody didn't smoke one day, how much wouldn't go into the atmosphere? We're just not smoking one day? When there's billions of people around the planet that smoke? Um, the biggest contributor to climate change is electrical generation. It's 35% of all the emissions we put into the sky come from generating electricity. The second biggest is animals, growing farm animals. It's methane and all the implementation of growing the crops to feed them and everything else that goes along with that. So if we ate less animal, we could save a lot on climate change. Okay. Next slide. So here's the pre-industrial age. I kind of looked at this at first and I was like, too bad, the guy taking a nap. You know, it was hard work, but it was seasonal. You didn't work hard all year round. You worked hard, planted your crop, and then you waited for it to grow, and then you harvested it, and you worked hard again, and then you put it up, and, and you were ready for next year. We have that picnic. It doesn't look too bad to me. Hillside looks nice. Got a lot of pollution, a lot of things going on. Next slide. Now we get into the effects of the Industrial Revolution. You've got child labor, working conditions, living conditions, people moved into the cities, we had problems because of overcrowding, we had epidemics, um, you know, we had emerging middle class. Um, a lot of things changed real fast. Next slide. Here's transportation back then. This was probably a really big wagon train. Um, now, next slide. Here we are burning again. We have trains burning wood and coal. We've got, uh, you know, getting up to cars and planes and everything else we do. Um, 
whole different picture when you think about it, how it could have been different. Next slide. So this is kind of small, but basically we're covering all the things that happened because of the Industrial Revolution. People moved to cities. Um, cities really account for 70% of the emissions. It isn't the people in the countryside, it's the people in the cities doing most of the burning and causing the issues. Next slide. So, what changed? Uh, when we first started doing oil um, and water, we, we found it on the surface. Next slide. Remember uh, the Beverly Hillbillies? He shoots and the oil comes bubbling up out of the ground right at the top. <coughs> no. And you got oil right off the top when you drilled down maybe 100 feet. Now we go six, 7,000 feet down in the ocean in the Gulf and then go sideways some more and to get oil out. A lot of oil when you're doing those kinds of things. So that's what's changed is our water and our aquifer has been depleted. We're down into the heavy metals that are left in our aquifers, so we have to clean our water better. We can't keep drafting out forever. We have to put something back. All the water in this area was put here 15,000 years ago during the Ice Age. We don't get recharge. That means we can't put it back easily. We built recharge ponds, but we're not getting water from Northern California because there's no snowpack anymore. So what do we do? We have to figure out a new way. Next slide. So we need to know how we consume energy today. So has anyone ever heard of the energy duck? Next slide. What does it look like? This is a graph of how we use energy, but does it look like a duck? Let's see a duck. So this is the hours of the day, 24 hour clock. This is evening. This is the net load of energy that we use. So this is called the tail of the duck. This is 2013. This was the back of the duck. Then this is the head of the duck. And then this goes right back to here and starts the next day. What changed? Here all of a sudden, 2015, we're down here. Look where the belly of the duck is, but the back of the duck's down here. It's going lower and lower. What, what changed? Solar. Renewables. We don't need energy during the middle of the day. What happens is everybody gets up in the morning, 8 o'clock or so, they go to work, go to school. Nobody uses any energy right here. But we have a whole bunch of it being made by uh, solar. And then they get home. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, start using more, turn on their TVs, air conditioners, heaters, and then we go back down at nighttime and drop off again. So the duck's telling us that we don't need energy midday anymore, or we need to change how industry works and start making them work midday when we have all this blood of energy available. So we have to rethink when we let certain people use energy and where we put our production for solar. Right now, it's always been south. Make energy all day long, put it on the south. We don't need it midday anymore. So what happens is the morning and the afternoon, peak time they're called, become more valuable. So this would be east. In the morning, you put a few panels over here and you put a whole bunch on the west. All of mine are on the west on our house. That's prime real estate. That's when the air conditioners are on. That's when you want to make the most energy. Eventually, that's when you get paid back the most for generating because you're putting it into the grid when it's needed. So no longer do we want to put all of our solar panels facing south. We want to do a little bit on the east and a whole bunch on the west. And we can start designing our systems locally rather than making a big generation plant that pushes electricity everywhere we put it on our roofs and we do a local grid just for us and we keep it right there. We don't push it thousands of miles away and lose 20, 30, 60% of our energy getting it there and then charge people for it. We're paying for that. So it's an improvement. Yeah, keep it local. You know. Keep it local. And that's where that local part, local economy, local part of the transition movement is coming from. Next slide. So, how do we generate electricity today? Here's the big power plant, Edison. You guys know Edison. <coughs> you know these big giant 
Iron Giants in the Desert. Then you have a receiving station. And then you come down to a distribution station. Then it comes to your home and it goes to industrial customers. And this would be like a Walmart, right? But what happens when you do solar here and here and here and here is you don't need any of this anymore. We can keep these. We can keep these because we will make a whole bunch of energy off of these and all of the excess we'll use what we need right here locally and we'll send that excess to the distribution station and then we can send it to LA or wherever the heck they need it. And that's happening right now whether we want it to or not. Um, the uh, state is determining whether they want to use eminent domain to take over the utility companies and get them out of the private sector and put them back to work for us. And I'm hoping they do it because that means they'll start taking our energy back, paying us for it on our rooftops, and we should be able to make our whole rooftop glass to catch rainwater because we're in a drought and make our whole rooftop a production field rather than scraping the desert and putting in farms that they want to charge us for again. And the, the other big thing you have to remember is if I have it on my roof and you have it on your roof and something happens to these, these power lines, any kind of problem, and you say, what could that be? Earthquake? Tornadoes? Hurricanes? War? What's the first thing that happens in war? They come in and they blow this guy up. Now nobody has any power. How do I know that? That's what we do when we go to war. We go over to Iraq and we blew up all their generation stations, all their water supplies. You cripple the country, you win the war. So all of this weak infrastructure disappears. We don't need it. You guys heard a telephone pole goes down in Yucca Valley and you don't have power for hours a day, two days. That's how weak that infrastructure is. Can you imagine an earthquake with a whole bunch of down poles? Or plants that are ruined and can't generate? If you have it on your roof, and I have it on my roof, and they have it on their roof, then I'm secure. I'm using my energy right off of my roof. It's already here. I'm not losing it in transmission. And I don't have to worry about somebody wanting to come get my energy either. So your energy is secure by having it right on your rooftop. So everybody says, well, what about nighttime? Well, right now you tie to the grid. And at nighttime, you buy back. But if you overgenerate during the day, you create like a checking account, right? You keep putting deposits in, deposits in, deposits in. And then at nighttime, you take a little bit out. Hopefully, you build your system big enough that you can do that, and you always come out ahead. Now you have this around yep. the wing. Yeah. Areas. And then there's also Germany is leading the way, so they're creating the the next generation of everything that is coming out. But you have solar, strictly solar water heaters. You know, most of the world uses solar water heating. They don't do it the way we do it. They don't put a water heater in a cool place and make it go on and off and waste energy. That's only here. And then the Germany's come out with what they call loof turbines. These can be stuck on this way on the corner of the building. They can be put on the peak of a roof and they're omnidirectional, which means the wind can come in from either direction, you can pass it around. And they generate 500 kW, which is a lot. Those big giant windmills down there, they're not green. Because there's all these moving parts and expensive turbines and all this wire and these big blades and oil that needs to be changed and the footing in the ground alone takes four or five years to offset from that thing generated to offset the carbon that's in that footprint of that footing. It's huge. They're not green. We do them because they're subsidized by our government. They make money out. They get paid. But it's not a really good way to do it. And it's ugly as heck, don't you think? You think anybody think that's pretty when you drive down through those things? Yeah. Like those Getting way, way too much. Yeah. But it isn't, again, it isn't necessary. We don't need nuclear plants. We don't need fossil fuel. We don't need this. 
There's no moving parts with solar panels. You put them on your roof, you clean them occasionally, and they work. And they work for a long, 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 long time. So we don't need the majority of that anymore. Next slide. So this is Siemens. Does that look cheap? No. That's the new generation of um, transmission lines that they're building. Does anybody know who owns that company? You told me. Koch Brothers. Yeah. Oil companies own Siemens. They also put the traffic signals in. And what do traffic signals do? Start to stop you? Well, when I worked at Firestone, I thought that was pretty great because you wore your tires out faster and your brakes and you did tune-ups, you wore your car out quicker. That was good for my business. I was happy. But in thinking back, it's not really a good way to be when the world is in the condition it's in and it's not sustainable behavior. We should be making things last longer. And I also learned, uh, I ran the first Firestone that got the first smog equipment in California. And we knew at 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour, a car puts water out the tailpipe if it's running properly. So you have no emissions if you keep cars moving. But if you start and stop them, that's where the emissions come from. If you stop on it and go really fast, you're dumping a lot of hydrocarbons. If you start and stop, you're dumping a lot of hydrocarbons. If you're moving along, pretty much clean air coming out. So why do we put in traffic lights that really start and stop? And it's that false economy they like to build. They like to generate you wearing out your car and having to buy a new one in three to five years. This, this wear everything out quickly and get, get it replaced. It isn't the way to be anymore. We can't afford it. Next slide. So here's a good start. This is one of the houses that the solar decathlon kids built. You've got some gardening going on here, some gray water feeds out, you've got some solar panels, you've got some shading and overstoring. They're really cool looking, you know, it's neat looking. But again, it isn't quite there. Next slide. This is an airship. Anybody familiar with them? So here's the earthen wall in the back. Here's the solar panels running the whole place. This is a passive solar wall that goes to a greenhouse garden where you can grow food even in the winter inside. This dome in the back is actually a cistern that collects water off of the roof from snow melt and rainfall. The wind and the cold comes this way over the earthen wall, passes over the roof, and never penetrates the building. Therefore, you really don't need a heating system. If you light a fire, it's probably just to look pretty. This is a much better way to build, and yet we don't incorporate that into our homes today, and we should. Our building codes need to change to reflect passive solar and heat gain. Next slide. So today's model is farm solar energy and fossil fuel-fired plants and nuclear power, which require huge, weak infrastructure and wasteful consumption. We talked about traffic lights. How about lights at night? Why do we have all these lights on at night? In the middle of the desert, street lights, dirt road, light on. Do the squirrels at night need to see? I don't know. Pretty weird. It's because they don't want to wind back their big generation plants and then wind them back up the next day. They want to use up all that energy and keep it going. But it's wasteful because we're burning fossil fuels and natural gas to do that. That's crazy, especially in this day and age. Uh, creates energy dependence and insecurity for the country, communities, and individuals at the same time. Next slide. This is Washington, D.C. Washington Monument. This is a parking structure covered in solar. So does that look good or does a, you know, a fossil fuel generation plant with smokestacks look better? Next slide. Anybody know what that one is? Oh, yeah. That's called Ivanpah. That's bright source. That's five square miles of thermal generation. Those are all mirrors and they focus the intensity of the sun to that cooling tower right there and they superheat water and then they run the generator down below. This cost billions of dollars to build and it failed. It's not working like it should. We paid for it. 
Because so anything that flies through there gets tried, you know, immediately because you're focusing those intense heat beams onto that tower. Um, the CEO of uh, NRG, which is the biggest company in the world that does solar, came out and said this is the wrong way to go. He said distributed solar on our rooftops is the right way. And he answered to his children. He said that because he said we we know one day we're going to get old and our kids are going to look at us and go, you knew and you kept building this stuff the wrong way. So they can't get that energy from where it is out between Vegas and us to the city. They lose too much. It's not working. It's the wrong way. This is five square miles and they covered up two geoglyphs. You guys know what geoglyphs are? It's things you see from the space. Guess what one of them was? The sun. They destroyed the geoglyph that the Native Americans built there of the sun and Pele. Two of them gone forever because of this. Next slide. Does this look cheap? These are nuclear plants. Do you feel safe with these or not? I don't. All of our plants in the U.S. are really old. They need to be decommissioned. I say Germany is shutting all theirs down by 2022. We could be there in five to 10 years too if we just got people motivated to put, put solar on the roof. Seriously, that's all it would really take. Who are they gonna sell their dirty energy to if we all have it on our roof? And we don't need everybody. We only need 25% of the population to put it on the roof. That's enough to power us for 200 years. Next slide. So we could have this, where it's your whole roof. Next slide. So what you can do, you can create an energy descent plan is what I call it. Um, the biggest thing you can do is obviously install solar and I say that because that's the one that will pay you back the fastest. Most systems today will pay themselves off in five years in energy savings. When you do the HERO program and you get the rebates, it's more like three to, three to four years. Um, unless you run your loan out over 20 years, which you will pay 20 years if you pay it out. But pretty much you could count on paying it off sooner than that. And let me tell you why. Right now, Edison just dropped this down from five tiers to four tiers. We're going to three tiers. What that means is, it used to be five tiers before you got into the highest tier, right? So you had all these other little zones you had to go through. Well, now you're at three, so you can get there really fast. And then from two to six, peak time, when you're turning your air conditioning on and your heating on, they're going to charge you 10 cents more per kilowatt. So you're paying maximum at three to the third Yep. So what does that mean? It means your electric bill is going to go up really fast. Not only are they getting a 6 to 20% increase every year, they're forcing you into the highest tiers faster. That means your electric bill in three years will be three times as high as it is today. So if it's an $80 bill now, it's a $180 bill in three years. So you buy your solar panels, you build your system to size, you make a $150 payment, and then at the end of whatever your term is, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you don't pay any more. But your payment is only gonna ever be $150, it's set. Right? If you're making all the energy you need, you're set. Everybody else is going to keep going up. And the other thing on your energy descent plan is you start looking at things that you burn. Propane, wood, eliminate them. Go to electric, run it with your roof, and you won't pay for it anymore. And those things will continue to go up because they're getting in short demand. That's why oil goes up. Is they haven't got much of it left. We were way beyond peak oil. What that does is you'll become energy independent. Um, we own three homes. My mom has one. We put solar on hers last year. Her bill is um, 275 or something like that. We pay the grid fee. Edison just raised solar people's bill to $10 because they think that we should subsidize the people that use more energy and dirty energy. Because you're um, smart. <laughs> I think that they're appeasing them right now because of the eminent domain thing that the state's bringing down the pipe. The state already runs about 15% of our grid. 
I hope they take it all over. And then we will get a new net metering agreement, and that is an agreement to buy our energy off of our roof, and we'll get paid more. We'll get paid what it's worth. Right now we get paid three and a half cents, but we get paid. And Edison does not like that. They want you to buy their energy, their dirty energy, and they don't want to have to pay you for your energy, which is clean. So part of your energy set plan is after you get rid of the propane stove and put an electric in and you get rid of your heater and put baseboard heaters in and you zone your house, which means you only heat the rooms you're in, and you start to think of ways, and what happens when you put it on your roof is you really start thinking about ways to use less. You start buying, this is a uh, LED light bulb. This came out, these are like 25 bucks for eight of them, so $3 a piece. These will last 15 years. They use 10 watts and they put out 75. So here's part of your energy cent plan. If you take out a CFL, the curly ones, those are 15, 18 watts. You can save eight watts per bulb, putting these in, and you'll never buy another bulb for 15 years. And if you change eight of them, you're saving over 100 watts in your house. So you buy a pack of these, even if you don't do solar, this is a good way to get your bill down. Because it, you know, spend $25 and knock off that bill that's gonna keep going up, and you will, it saves a lot of money. These are night light bulbs that are LED. They use one watt and put out seven. So you could run seven of these for what you're paying to run one night light right now. LEDs, really cool. They don't get hot either. They're cooler operating. They make daylights, which is a better light spectrum for your eyes. So they're just great ways to do it. So I brought my little house here to kind of demonstrate overstory. So basically when you, uh, when you have like a, a home and the sun's up overhead, if you put it like this, you would shade the house and you wouldn't um, get much sunlight into it, right? So the other thing you want to do though is if you build a structure, don't build it flat. Build it at an angle and face it south because what happens is in the winter time, the sun actually moves down and over here, right? And if you face it south, in the summertime you're in the shade, but in the winter time, you allow the sunlight to come in under your shade structure and heat your house for free. That's passive solar. It's thinking about how things work and actually using nature to do most of your energy generation for you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's a new bowl. Uh, next slide. So this is one of our electric bills in our house. Um, they just raised this. We paid $1.71. Um, next slide. This is my generation charges. It tells me that they owe me $41 for that month because I overgenerated. So I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a generation point on my roof. Year to date, they owe me $284.97. And now they're taking $10 instead of $1.71. That used to be the grid fee. We were still paying the grid fee, what everybody else pays. That $1.71 is the grid fee. We were still maintaining the grid with that. That's why they're collecting it every month. And yet they think that they need to punish us for making clean energy and not buying their dirty energy. Still at $10, it's, it's a bargain because I know it's gonna change eventually. I know that the state will probably take it over and run it, and we will start getting paid more for our energy instead of three and a half cents, we'll probably get up around six cents, which is where it should be. Because that's what it costs them to dirty generate the energy that they sell you for 11, all the way up to 31 cents when you hit those tiers. So, next slide. So that's our house, $1.52 we paid. Now we'll pay $10. Next slide. So we used to pay some months $250, $300 when it was hot and when it was really cold. So we had big bills. Um, 60, 80 would be the norm when it's moderate out. Next, uh, and also you can see Here's what I was paying 
and this is when I was generating. It's going the other way. It's nothing funner than to turn on a system and watch people smile when this meter starts running backwards. Goes back to Edison. They're paying you. Next slide. So what you can do is stop burning natural gas, propane, wood, coal, and switch to electric systems. And I say be a solar, not a burner. Next slide. Um, this is a really cool thing when I put the system in. So, and basically this is a solar panel. It's a small one. They're obviously about five and a half feet by 42 inches. So this is a sample of what they look like. Um, the way they're made is, this is actually a crystal that is grown in a manufacturing process where they take a seed crystal, they superheat silica sand, if you can believe it, it's just sand, and they get it up to like 2200 degrees they barely touch that seed crystal into it and they start to extrude these big crystals and they pull them up and they actually grow them in a plant. And then they slice them really thin and they put them into the panel. And that's what collects the energy from the sun. It collects photons and it converts it into DC electricity. And then from DC, which is what all the panels put out, we go to AC using an inverter. I use microinverters. This is one of these for every single panel. Um, many reasons why I chose to do this, these are more expensive, but they last longer, they're guaranteed longer, they're more efficient, and they're monitorable. That's the best part. So I can get a little computer box, and this is what I give everybody when they get a system, that monitors every single one of these, which monitors every single one of those panels. So it knows what's going on with your whole system every minute of every day, and gives you total readouts and when I first put mine on, I thought Edison was stealing, you know, three or four hundred kilowatts from me every month because I kept missing. You know, they'd say I made this much, and I show I generated this much. I didn't realize what I was missing was what I was using in my own home. It was me. We, we used it up. You were stealing. I was stealing my own electricity. Yeah. We actually burned it. Um, but the reason I chose these is they're small. I don't know if you've seen the big ones called Sunny Boys and different things. They're big inverters. And they, they're called string inverters. It's the old technology, okay? It's the first ones that came about. And what they do is they put the panels on your roof, they run DC voltage down to this big inverter, and it's a giant heat sink. It means it's, it's you know, transforming that energy from DC to AC. It's dumping a lot of it and changing it. And that puts out a lot of heat. And that actually puts a lot of, uh, electromagnetic fuel down. It's not good for you. These do them in small quantities right at the panel, way up high on the roof. They're underneath the panel. So we mount them under here so they're in the shade. They're on the rail. And then air is moving under here, right? So you're cooling your inverters. And they're small and they're not giant heat sinks. So they last longer. So then they're warranted 25 years just like the panel because they're not going to burn out in eight to 10 years like a string inverter will. How much are they? These are like 220 bucks. That's not bad. So you one of those for every panel? One of those for every panel. You'll pay $2,800 for a big inverter. Right. But the benefit of this is each one of these is microchipped. It's monitoring every single panel. It will also diagnose itself. So if you have a panel getting shaded by a tree limb, it'll come on and tell you it's not working right, something's wrong. Go check it out. If it's not working right, it'll actually go red and, and tell you there's a problem with that panel. It will tell the company that makes these and they will send you a letter and tell you you need to have it checked out. And they will diagnose it for you. So you get lifetime monitoring and diagnostics with this system. Whereas with a big inverter, it's like a car program. You have to be able to interpret what's in that little LED crystal thing. So you gotta hire somebody they have got to get on your roof and test your panels and try to figure out which one's having a problem. This is a way, way better system for the little bit extra that you pay. And it puts out more energy and is more efficient. So that's why I choose them. All right, so the next slide. Oh, no, wait. Two days. Um, this is the report you get. So this month I generated 3.9, well, that was year to date. I don't know how long ago this was, but. I generate 3.9 megawatts. I make almost a megawatt a month off my roof with 24 panels. That's a lot of energy. 
905 kilowatts. So the carbon I offset is 1,619 pounds. That's the same as 19 full grown trees would do. So it's like I planted 19 trees by putting this on my roof. So you're really doing a big, big benefit to the world when you do this. Also, this is my roof. So this is the main house. These are my panels. Each one being monitored, it's showing me how much it's generating. There's a vent pipe right here, that's why there's not one there. And this is my garage, and this is a skylight right here. So, and that's 24 panels. So, so normal medium size. That's actually big. It's big. That's a big system, but I'm getting paid too. Right. I built it big just to see, you know, if they would scream, and they did. They didn't turn it on for me for three months, mm -hmm. I think it was. They don't like it when you overgenerate. They really don't. And yet, solar farms get paid and they can do it. Why can't we? Why can't we make an investment and contribute our energy into our system in our country? Did you have to bring the court to turn it on? No, no. They just drug it out, made it miserable, made it hard, lost paperwork, and I reported it. And it got better, and it's getting better now. Now I get them turned on within two weeks. Um, I don't know if anybody knows Bobby first. It took 70 days to get his turned on because he had an existing system. And they wanted to know everything about that old system. Well, it was 10 years old. I didn't know anything about it. I had to look everything up. But they made it my problem to turn on his new system. I had to tell them all about his old system. Which is just... Which they had everything because they had an NEM on him from yeah. 10 years ago. But it's Edison. They don't like doing this. But this is a really cool thing that you get with a system when I build it. And, and here's the thing, I, I do it for 385 kW, which is a kilowatt. Um, the going rate is 450 to 18 dollars on some of these leases that people are getting stuck with. Do not do a lease. Um, it's like leasing a car, it's one of the worst things you can do. It's hard to transfer an ownership of your home. If you go to sell, nobody wants to buy it because they've got to buy that system lease and they don't necessarily want to do that. Um, you want to own your system. You want to get your rebates, your 30%. You want to get your tax incentives. I want people to do this because it's the right thing to do and that's why I'm doing it cheaper. I'm giving you the best system for less than anybody else out there. And you can shop around. Unless you go buy a really like five-year-old equipment that's discontinued, there isn't a better price out there. And you can do that, <coughs> but you'll end up with you know four times the amount of panels on your roof covering your whole roof and generating less. You want to leave room to add to your roof later if you add things to your home like an electric car, which we'll talk about in a minute. Next slide. Solar City, uh, Renova, everyone does that. I can do that. I have companies approach me every day to do leases and I tell them no. I have people ask me to put it on the ground and I tell them no. I'm not going to do those because I don't agree with them. But it is common. It's very common. And people are still doing it because it's, oh, it's zero money down. Well, zero is zero money down. Zero finances everything. You didn't have anything out of your pocket. Uh, on a lease, what they do is they take that 30% when they're done and they put it in their pocket. They keep it. They reduce your electric bill a little bit, okay? And they own your roof for 20 or 25 years. It's not your roof anymore. <coughs> they own that system on your roof. And they tell you, oh, well, we'll do the maintenance. What maintenance? Do they come out and wash them? No, I've never seen a lease company come out and ever wash anybody's panels. That's all you really need to do to your panels. And the rainstorms out here wash them pretty good. Um, too, your electric bill gets pretty high. Yeah. And, like and leases are like like car dealerships. When you lease a car dealership lease, they're all over the place. I mean, you could be paying eight bucks, you could be paying sixteen bucks. They they have prepay it off and, and get a reduced rate on your electric. It, it's a gimmicky thing. It's all on paper. It's what banks do. And you know, when they do the interest and they hide the points up front and all that stuff. It's the same game. I don't like it. I don't think people should do it. On the other hand, I think it's better than not doing solar at all. I'd have to say that. 
because you're at least helping climate change if you put it on your roof and you're doing it. And you will get a little bit less of electric bill. They will knock it down. Okay? This is fracking. Another thing we shouldn't be doing. Um, next slide. Um, why solar panels? They're merely collectors. They don't make the electricity. So you're merely buying the tool that collects the energy for free. Energy is free from the sun. And our sun is pretty new. It's uh, probably only half burned out at this point. We got a couple billion years left. Um, good yeah, I think it'll, it'll last my lifetime. The energy from the, fun, the sun is free. It's called photons. Um, it's right outside your door every day, all day long. It's what makes everything melt out here in the desert. Your dashboard on your car and everything else. Those are what's bombarding you. Um, mitigation. I talk about mitigation because there are 26 lines of mitigation in a solar farm. I mean, from cutting off wildlife habitat to dust abatement to uh, just crazy stuff. You can't believe, you know. Ducks crash into them because they think they're late and they die. I mean, all kinds of problems around doing farm solar. And you're destroying the crust on the earth in the desert. One square foot of desert sequesters more carbon than anywhere else in the world. It's, it's like got a, a, an aerobic bacterial um, crust in the ground that takes all that carbon and sequesters it into the ground naturally. Now, we do that with coal. You know, we clean coal, you've heard of that? Well, the way they make coal clean is they take the stack stuff after they burn the coal and they scrub it and they take all that smoke and, and carbon and they sequester it in the ground mechanically. The problem with that is, is if the ground is stable. If you have an earthquake, it could be released. If you have too much water, it gets into the water. If you have all these problems coming out of sequestering carbon unnaturally and drilling into the ground like we do over and over, thousands of times around the planet unnaturally. It's not good for the planet. We're getting earthquakes more and more often in areas that never had earthquakes, like Oklahoma. Never had earthquakes. But we've punctured the ground so many times, we've messed it up. This is what we do really well. So, mitigation is the act of mitigating or lessening the force or intensity of something unpleasant as wrath, pain, grief, or extreme circumstances. To me, it's doing something you know is wrong, but doing it anyway and say, we'll fix it in the end, or we'll trade you this really nice piece of land over here, you can have that if we can mess this one up really bad. So we gotta quit doing that too. You know, there's no reason you know, we can put solar panels up there and we get all of our energy for us for free. <laughs> there's no moving parts. They don't wear out, at least not in my lifetime or your lifetime. Um, there's very little maintenance. You get a 30% rebate. So if you're buying a $15,000 system, you're getting $4,500 hundred dollars back on your taxes the first year. If you do the hero loan, <coughs> and we do it before the end of this year ends, you won't even go on your your property tax bill till November of next year. So you'll get your rebate back, you can lower your payment, and you'll never make a payment or an electric payment until November of next year. It's pretty cool. And then you do two payments just like your taxes, November and April. So you divide it in half and you pay. Uh, next slide. And there is no prepayment penalty. <coughs> kind of fuzzy. Um, basically, it's an instant approval. It's really easy to do. You can go to Hero Financing, put in your address and your information. It will tell you right away what's available on your home. And it's based on the value of their home. They're, they're doing like a 10% over what the house is worth. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's really easy to do. It takes five minutes to find out. We can do it here, or, or you can do it yourself. Um, there is no real loan packages. It's basically, um, we call them. You decide you want to do it. You tell them you want to do it. They give a thing called a notice to proceed to me. I go do permits, I do it, and then you tell them he did it. And you sign a thing that says, it's done, and you're done. And it's that easy. It's really, really, really a simple thing. And it only takes 15, 20 minutes to do any one of those steps. 
They do have a lot of trouble out here finding addresses sometimes. You know, there's like houses that have three different addresses for some reason. Um, next slide. So, yeah, I know, it's weird. Where we're going? Um, I don't know, you heard about the balls up in Castaic area where LA bought 50 billion balls and covered the lake to keep evaporation down. $24 million they paid. And these are solar panels on a bay area that create energy that also stop evaporation. It's a little smarter way than balls. You have to go turn the balls twice a year or something. I don't know who does that. Maybe ball turner or something. Uh, next slide. Um, there's an International Society of Solar. Um, there's quite a few of these popping up around the world, but they push solar initiatives around the world and especially in third world countries. Next slide. Uh, this is a Sopel hot water heater. Has an inlet in and a hot water out. Doesn't use electricity, doesn't use propane. Basically, you just have to learn not to take a shower in the morning because it's probably be cold to the satellite, but it will stay hot well into the evening until 9, 10 at night the way they're built. Built in Austria. You can't get something like this from the U.S. because we just don't do it here. But the Germans and the Austrians and the Swiss are building all these things. I'm putting one of these on my house to test it, and if it's really good, we're going to start selling it. Next slide. Um, this is a Helios waterproof panel, or it could be a roof. Just lap them. They have like squeegee seals that seal them up, and it could be the roof of your house. It's glass. It would never wear out of the roof. You could catch really clean water off of it because it's glass. There's no edges on these. They actually have rubber seals that seal them up around the edges. And that's the way all your panels are going. Pretty soon they'll all be frameless, and they just use a, like mirror mount clips to hold on to them. So the aluminum frames are going away. Uh, next slide. This is a sick panel. This is one that will last a thousand, two thousand years. Uh, no cadmium, um, no soldered joints. Um, very, very clean production. This is the way we should be building panels right now instead of the way we're building them because they're full of, you know, bad chemicals and things. Although they last, you know, two hundred years, we could be building them better and cleaner. And these can't be imported yet for some reason. They don't want them here. But they're uh, about 35% more productive for the same size panel. Uh, they don't get hot spots and they do not degradate. That means thousands of years of long oh, life. Yeah, about three times as much, not that much. I mean, that's where we were 10 years ago with these panels. What are doing now? Next slide. Uh, these are the panels that we're installing. They're made by Solar World. It is a Chinese company, but they're made in the U.S. and Oregon by Americans. That's why I use them. Uh, the whole panel is built here. 25-year um, warranty. Uh, we're up to 285. I expect by the end of the year we'll be up to 300 watts in the same size panels. My house has 250s on it, so we've got 35 watts in a year and a half. So I expect we'll have 300 pretty soon. They do make bigger panels, but we, we do this size because they're easier to handle with the winds and stuff like that. Um, what, what's the dimensions on that? Those are 42 by 66. 5 feet, 6 inches. Okay. So just under 6 foot. Uh, they weigh about 30 pounds. They add about 1 pound per foot to the roof load so they can fit on almost any roof. Yeah. Um, you're bolted down on rails. And you go into the rafters on the roof, and you have very few penetrations. And we seal those up with a uh, hydraulic sealer that actually expands. It'll never leak where we put the penetrations in. And actually, your roof will last longer because you're shading it. It'll extend the life of any roof. Next slide. Uh, solar structure. That's a two-car um, cantilever structure with solar panels on it. Steel. Is asking about steel. That's an all steel structure. Uh, next slide. You know, they're um, at Onaga Elementary School. They're building these mm -hmm. in, the, in the parking lot. They're going to do it at our elementary school, too. At the Joshua Tree one, too? Yeah, it's the same company that wants to cover our airport with solar, which we don't want. Mm -hmm. um, earth biotexture. 
Uh, this is an airship. This is kind of my Bible, what I've done all my studies off of and expanded on. But basically, the sun is up here. It doesn't pass into the building, but then it drops down here and goes into the atrium area. Thermal wall here. So in the wintertime, it comes in here, heats up this, and the mass transfers into the room. They're using tires, recycled materials to build with. All the beams are done with beetle dead wood. They don't cut down green trees, they cut beetle dead tree and use the whole beam. Uh, this is a cistern for water, so all the water runs off the roof. The snow melt goes into the cistern and that is the water for the home. They filter it and drink it. This is a geothermal, this is an earthen wall. It's ramped up or you actually build into the hillside if you're on a hillside. But hot air gets taken in through here by a convection goes in here and we know that when you get about 12 feet down it's about 57 degrees so you have free air conditioning and you draw it through and out and you get free air conditioning in the summertime in your house. All these systems are proven they've been around for years and years and years it's nothing new. Um, Mike Reynolds just happens to be one of the guys that decided we're building wrong and started building right. You can actually take an existing square building and Earthen up this wall, make it really thick. What happens? Here comes a cold wind. It can't penetrate the building. It actually ramps up and goes over the roof and never goes into your house. You put up a big flat square wall and you blow against it. That cold will penetrate the wall. Now you've got to heat it. And then conversely, in the in the uh, summertime, when the heat's baking down on it, the cool out of the earth, the geothermal just pulls up out of the earth into the building, so you don't have to cool it or not nearly as much, so you can use much smaller systems or no system at all if you do it right. So I'm actually building these systems and there's also a uh, next step on the water system is the biofiltration field. So all the gray water comes out of the bathtub and the shower and the lavatories and the laundry and they go into this gray water system and then you run it downhill to the end of that system that's usually 25 feet long and basically you plant your food crops in there you grow your garden and your bananas and whatever in there and you eat that food it's watered by your gray water and then the plants will actually clean the nitrates out of that gray water so when it reaches the other end of that system it's really clean well enough to, to use and drink and filter again but what he does is he pumps that water into your toilet and flushes the toilet with it. And then that goes into your septic outside, but then there's a black water field that's longer and deeper and you plant perennials and long rooted grasses to clean that. And then the water just evaporates back into the system. So you use the water four times before it ever made it back into the system. I'm building on where I'm actually taking the last stage and I'm pushing the water down into our aquifer again. And I force rainwater into my biofields to flush them and clean them out periodically. So we're building an all natural system where we don't need a waste paper plant ever. Plants are cleaning it for me. I'm getting food from them. If you want to plant things that give you food. And hopefully I'll plant you know, crops that I can grow and actually sell to make money off of like in fact mesquite groves and things like that and uh, harvest the pod, make flour and sell the flour at the local market. That local economy thing we're talking about. So, next slide. So this is a rainwater harvesting system. These are called totes. They're stackable, three high. They hold 275 gallons. Um, water off the roof. This is a corrugated roof. Goes into the gutter, into the tank. And then you can just water your yard with that water instead of using drinking water and buying it pumped out of the ground. You can use that. You could actually filter the water and drink it if you had to. So if everything went to heck and it rained, you would have water. If you don't have something like this, what are you going to do? Where would you get water if you didn't store it or have a way to get it? So these systems should be built on homes automatically if you want to be sustainable, if you want to have the potential to have water. Um, we're actually doing this uh, for a customer here. We're putting in 1,600 gallons worth of tanks on, on a 3,200 uh, square foot roof. We're doing corrugated roofing on steel studs with an underlayment 
over the existing roof. So we're doing the overstory. So we're putting corrugated over the existing roof. It's now it's a lifetime roof basically, it'll last pretty much forever, unless it rusts out, which out here doesn't happen very often. The underlayment goes down, seals up the existing roof. Cool air now can move through here in the summertime, blow up under that steel like a radiator and take the heat away through the peak. And basically we just have little doors that we flip over and open. So we can open and close the eaves in between the corrugated roof and the old roof. And in the wintertime we can close them and create a dead air space to create heat pockets and more insulation value, which will transfer into the house and give you free heat for the summer. So this just got approved by Hero also, so we can do these systems now on a Hero program. And actually the corrugated roof system was the max efficiency factor that they could give to a roofing system. So it's way, way better than an asphalt roofing system because you're taking all that heat from the sun during the day into your asphalt roof, even if it's white and reflective, they're still heating up the wood and the attic space very quickly. With a corrugated system, you're reflecting more energy away, and then you have this cooling effect here going on where it's taking the heat away like a radiator. So your house and your attic stay much, much cooler, like almost 15 degrees. Next one. So where are we going in the future? Plug in electric cars. Why do you want to plug them in? You should just have solar cars. You should drive down the road and it's charging, and you park it at work and it's charging, and you park it at home and it's charging, and then you just plug it in to top it off. You shouldn't have to plug in an electric car. It should be a solar car. Really charge now with the density and control it over parking lots. Yeah, that's stupid, isn't it? Solar should go over the building. Yeah. You should overstory the building, make the building efficient, and park your car in the summer. Actually, what, what will happen is you get out of your car, and these windows will tint down, that will be your shade, automatically. You'll have automatic tinting windows, so just black out, keep the sun out, and the car will stay cool. So, um, plug in solar cars will be battery back up to your house. So you have the solar panels on your roof, running your whole house, you get free energy, you bring your car home, you plug it into your house, now your house charges your car, right? Now it gets to be nighttime and you're using electricity, you have these great batteries in your car that will run your house. So you don't need Edison anymore, you can go out there. And the car batteries could run your house for a week. That's how strong car batteries will be. You've got a whole bunch of them around the electric motors. Um, the charger called the Powerwall that Tesla's putting out right now has an ion battery that will run your house for a day. So basically, you could put one of those in, they're about $3,500. They are the charger for your car when you get your car. And the next Tesla car out is going to be about $35,000. We'll have a $7,500 rebate. And it will probably go between three and 600 miles on a single charge. And that's all coming. I mean, he's building it. Next. Bullet trains. You buy bullet trains, we're not going to build this anymore. It's too expensive. Billions of dollars. It uses a lot of electricity. It's super heavy. It uses um, earth, earthen natural magnets that we don't have many of anymore. Um, it, it was a great idea back in the 70s when it was first thought of, and they have built some in, in Japan. Our friend Elon Musk is already building the first 50 miles of the Hyperloop which is basically a train, it's like a monorail, you've got two tubes up overhead, and you get in the car and then they turn a fan on at the other end and they suck you to San Francisco at 200 miles an hour. And it'll go 800, but they got to figure out how to slow it down so you don't get smashed at the end. But they're building it already, I mean it's not, this is not the future, this is now. They're actually got, the first 50 miles are going in from San Jose to San Francisco. And Elon Musk is building. He's kind of one of my big heroes. He's like Howard Hughes and uh, Henry Ford in one. He, uh, he's tied into SpaceX. Um, he sends rockets into space and satellites. He's building the electric cars. He's building the battery plant right now that will. He owns Solar City, if you don't know that. That's his brother in law, runs it, but that's his company. 
Um, and now he's got Hyperloop. And it's pretty cool. He's put solar panels over the top of that to run the fans. Um, it's about a tenth of the price of a bullet train, or the, the other train. And um, it's way, 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 way cheaper to run than, than the electricity it takes to run one of those uh, levitation bullet trains. And they're a lot safer. Uh, you're up above, you can put those things above the existing freeway, you don't have to disturb any special land or put in tracks and everything. Uh, way, way better systems. Next slide. Anybody know what that one is? The Gosps. Gosps. Yeah. It's already flew around the world. This is a totally solar powered. All these wings are covered in solar panels. It flew around the world already. Airbus just put out an ad, an ad saying they're going to have a, a, a plane that will fly transcontinentally by 2022. So, solar, electric. They're already designing and working on it. When this guy finished his flight, he sat in the cockpit for like 20, 30 minutes and they finally came up and no one asked him what he's doing. And he said, I'm just sitting here thinking about all the people that told me I couldn't do this. But they told me it couldn't be done. And yet, there he sat, and he did it. So, there's lots of people that say we can't do things. There's a few people that do it, and, and it can be done. So, I think the future is pretty bright. I think we have a lot going for us, but I think electricity is the way, and I think you know putting solar on your roof is a smart thing to do right now. Anyone? Um, oh, yeah. A little more shift it could. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You can go to two minutes of sunlight and see this whole presentation there if you forgot anything. Um, there's all kinds of information on rainwater harvesting and different things we're doing. Also our vacation rentals on there if you want to see what we're doing with that stuff. It's actually old 50s trailers that I've restored. People come stay in on them. They have a water heater on the roof and a glass box, and they're overstoried, and there's biofuels going in place right now. So we're doing all this so people can see it and know you can do it, not just Two talk about it. Two minutes of sunlight. Two minutes of sunlight. Out of the world for a year. You have to put the little slash yes. in into it? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. With your um, rain water catching system, <laughs> in this area, how, can, how much can you expect? Um, it's actually we have monsoons, and it, the, 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 the formula is for a thousand square foot of roof, with one inch of rainfall, you would get 680 gallons. I can tell you that that's way off out here. We have flash flooding. And yeah. monsoons hit, we get so much rain so fast. I could tell you that yeah, you, you could probably fill almost anything you put in place, and I'm talking like upwards of six to 8,000 gallons. Of yeah, which gallons. Is probably makes more sense because sometimes it doesn't mean totally yeah. gallons. So you have two totes together are 550. Yeah. I have 1,100 on one property, my mom has 1,100. And then we have a 205 out front, but I used to have more. I used to have close to 3,000, and I, I would fill that pretty easily. What kind of roofs are they all solar? Um, they have solar on them, but we have composition. I just put gutters all the way around. And we have such weird microclimates out here. I mean, I got two people, like a football field apart, and they're like at war about who collects more rainwater. It's really funny how protective of you know the rainwater they get when it starts getting into their tanks. I mean, oh, my corner's leaking. It's like, you have to dump it on the ground and bring it up your drips up here. Every little bit helps, yeah. Yeah, the three stage filter. You would, uh, basically, you're going to get butyls off of the copper roof, a little uh, composite rock. Um, I'm actually finding this mesh uh, mosquito screen. And you do have to screen for mosquitoes out here. We don't have a lot of them, they're really tiny, but you will get them. Um, and so you want to make sure they don't get into your tanks. Um, the tote tanks, I mean, there's commercial systems, which is Bushman. And, uh, the ones I build were those, I think I got pictures here. Yeah. So here's, um, 
you can see them. Yeah, I can get it on some lights. Yeah, put the light on. Anyway, these are two tanks. We painted them at first. This is Rhonda Hayes. She filled this one up in about 10 minutes, first time it rained on her house. And actually, she overflowed the gutter because it, it wasn't flowing through the drain no, pipe fast enough. These people have 3,800 gallons and they catch yeah. that three times a year. Yeah, 200. So you have a little more stuff and you can stack it. Yeah. Pretty cool. And then it overflows. And he, um, like the, the guy that we're doing, we're putting corrugated roofing on his house. Yeah, we're going to install a roof on his house. And what we're going to yeah. do is wrap them in the corrugated yeah, metal. Yeah. So it matches it. So it's yeah. cool. Well, they so I have a good video of these. Thank you. Yes. I have like 10% battery left, so. Yeah, you filmed the last presentation. Yeah, this one I got more. I got an hour and 17 minutes. Really on your phone? Yeah. Wow. The only, the, and it's really hard to upload.